their floating junkyards. Mothballed, decommissioned naval vessels. Toxic time bombs filled with PCBs, asbestos, lead paint, oil, and grease. Hundreds rust in dockyards around the world. What can be done with them? Since 1991, this team of Canadians has had an integrated approach. They clean the ships and sink them. Meticulously timed explosive charges cut through the steel plate like a hot knife through butter. The ship sinks in minutes. Out of all this mayhem and explosive energy comes life, marine life, as these former warriors turn into artificial reefs. Within days, algae begins to grow, creating food for other animals, who in their turn attract other predators, increasing diversity until an entire reef ecosystem comes into being. Artificial reefs, magnets for life, and magnets for divers. Wellington, New Zealand. This is the frigate Wellington, the F-69. And a week from now, she'll be on the seabed. As an avid diver, Marco Zeman thought that sinking a ship to make an artificial reef would be a good idea. And that idea became a passion that would occupy six years of his life. The F-69 started life as the British Royal Navy ship, Bacanti and saw service in the Cod War with Iceland and in the Falklands War. In 1982, she joined the New Zealand Navy and was renamed the Wellington. Before the Wellington can be sunk, she must be spotlessly clean. 113 meters long, 3,100 tons, the ship is massive. And as Marco is learning, so is the amount of work yet to be done before the scheduled sink day of November 12. But today, all the previous years of meetings and planning and obstacles fade away as the F-69 gets towed into Wellington Harbor for the final prep work before sinking. Today, the weather is picture perfect but the city has a nickname, Windy Wellington, because of the strong winds that sweep up the Cook Strait. These winds could make sinking the F-69 a challenge. Now docked in Wellington Harbor, the final preparation work is underway. Removing hatches, pipes, anything that could pollute the ocean be unsafe for divers, or be sold for scrap, even the ship's nameplate. But the work is going slowly, and the sinking day, with all the fanfare and anticipation, is fast approaching. Roy Gabriel. I guess we've been here in 28, 29 days now. The first day I walked on board the ship, I couldn't believe it. I walked on, I thought that a lot of the initial design would have been done inside the ship and the preparation done. And I walked on, there wasn't a single bulkhead or a wall or anything taken out, and it was almost panic station. Don't believe it. Roy Gabriel has sunk more ships than some navies. A retired Royal Canadian Mounted Police explosives expert, he's one of the partners of Canadian artificial reef consultants. And he's here to provide his experienced guidance. It's been a month now of 12 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to get this thing to the point where it is now. The brute force work of scrap removal continues. Craig! So we 
we've got to get this tank out of here. You see that or open it up and clean it out, and that takes too long. Artificial reefs attract life, and they attract divers. And divers bring tourism dollars. This is the former USS Spiegel Grove, just off Key Largo in the Florida Keys. It's now a major dive attraction, but it had a troubled beginning. And it's a good example of the potential risks when you sink thousands of tons of steel. After cleaning, the 155-meter, 5,400-ton Spiegel Grove was towed into position and anchored for the final preparations. But on May 17, 2002, a day before she was supposed to sink, something, and no one knows exactly what, went wrong. The ship began to sink. She was not only sinking, but she started to roll over, ending up upside down, a hazard to navigation, and certainly not an artificial reef. Finally, after much blood, sweat, tears, and money, salvage teams got her on the bottom, but on her starboard side. Today, with a little nudge from Hurricane Dennis in 2005, she's upright and becoming a thriving reef, popular with divers. While Roy Gabriel is working on the Wellington in New Zealand, his partners, Wes Roots and Jay Straith, are checking out what could be the next project, a Canadian destroyer escort. Their team has been involved in sinking some 19 ships, with the Wellington being number 20. They've learned what it takes to do a controlled sinking of a ship. Jay Straith explains. Sinking a ship is a lot more than just adding explosives and running like hell. What you actually have to do is be very careful to calculate how stable you keep that ship during the sinking operation. The key points you've got to watch for are the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy of the ship. When the ship is unflooded, the center of buoyancy is low in the ship and the center of gravity is high in the ship. As the ship begins to flood, the center of buoyancy moves up while the center of gravity moves down. But if the ship is flooding unevenly, or if there's air trapped inside, then the center of buoyancy will shift, and the ship may begin to list on one side. There are about 30 crucial seconds where the centers of buoyancy and gravity pass each other when the ship is most vulnerable. If the center of buoyancy and the center of gravity pass each other more than about 30 centimeters apart, the ship will likely roll onto its side. A ship like the F-69 has hundreds of compartments that could trap a pocket of air, creating unwanted buoyancy and instability. If the sinking is going to go as planned, it's important not to overlook a single one. So project manager Norm Greenall and Roy check and double check. Uh, 10 minutes. The adventure of diving a wreck is getting inside the ship. And that means cutting access holes, enough of them so divers can get in and get out. These holes also help flood the ship in the sinking process. And all over the ship, there are vent holes to let the air inside the ship escape as the water rushes in. Once you've reviewed the plans, Getting the ship properly vented comes down to looking in every spot a pocket of air could collect, and then marking it with a spray can of paint. Then the cutting torches can go to work making the vents. The muscle behind the ship sinking is high-tech explosives. This is a sample of the uh, copper flex linear that will be used to explosively scuttle the frigate Wellington. It's RDX explosives on the inside with a, a copper sheeting around the outside. It's designed and built specifically for cutting steel. The shape of the explosive charge controls the shock wave that's produced, creating an intense, narrow cone of energy that can slice through an inch of steel plate. 
What we have here is the uh, face side or business side of the explosive charge. This is the portion that will face the inside of the ship and this is where the, it will actually physically cut a meter square hole or a 39 inch square hole out of the side of the ship. The explosion first pushes the steel out. Then the water forces its way in. Marco Zeman has less than a week left before sink day, and there's still a lot to get done. One of our biggest challenges on ships this size is all the hydraulic oil that we've got to deal with. There's lots of it, and every drop needs to be removed before sinking. Cleaning up spilled oil isn't a high-tech job. Spread sawdust on the oily patch and scoop it up. Then dump it into a disposal bin and then go back and do it again. On board every ship is miles and miles of wire. So what we have to do on board these ships is remove every bit of wire. What will happen, these brackets will start to deteriorate faster than the rest of the ship, and these will start to fall apart, and subsequently the wire will drop down and will become a hindrance to divers. So this is fine to leave in. This won't be a problem. But the main main bunches of wire running through the raceways have to come out. It's not only diver safety that's an issue. The insulation on these wires could possibly contain toxic PCBs, and that's something that just can't go into the ocean. Wiring throughout the ship is all removed. It's got a lot of copper in it. For example, that piece there would be worth probably three or four dollars, and you've got tons, literally tons of it. One of the ways they fund these artificial reef projects, such as the Wellington here, is through pure scrap value. They'll scrap the ship and use that money to prep the rest of the ship. A ship like this will be in excess of $250,000 of scrap value. And what you see is the boys out here processing that scrap now as it's coming off the ship. It's a safe bet that no one was thinking about scrap value when the HMC of Saskatchewan, a Canadian destroyer escort, was launched in 1963 at Esquimalt, British Columbia. These ships, sleek and fast, were regarded as the Cadillacs of the fleet. Now, only about 110 kilometers north of where she was launched, the Saskatchewan is offering another sort of Cadillac experience as a stunning wreck dive, just a short distance from Nanaimo, British Columbia. For Jay Strait, it's a bit of a homecoming. He and his partners helped to sink her in 1997 with the Artificial Reef Society of British Columbia. Marine animals, like these anemones, have flourished, colonizing the 110-meter-long, 2,600-ton ship. Ian Hall, a local dive operator, has seen the impact the wrecks have made. The Saskatchewan sank in 1997, and almost immediately, the number of tourists coming to the island to dive Nanaimo increased. The City of Nanaimo Economic Development Commission estimates through a rudimentary survey that dive tourism means three and a half to four million dollars into the local economy each year. Just what is it about shipwrecks and divers? Is it the marine life? Or is it the technical challenge? Whatever the reason, they exert a strong pull. We drove down from Toronto, took us a couple of days, and it's so, you know, over 3,000 kilometers. So you know we're, we're wreck hungry when you drive that far just to, just to dive some, some pristine wrecks like the Spiegel Grove. The Spiegel Grove is that ship that rolled upside down before being sunk in Key Largo, Florida. It offers divers something extra. It's like actually revisiting a piece of history. It's sometimes, you know, they're like almost like museum pieces down there. Truly a thrill. The Florida Keys are a major destination for divers. 
and artificial reefs are a big attraction. And it's where Lad Atkins heads up a group studying their environmental impact. Gary Mace runs one of the many dive businesses in Key Largo, Florida. Spiegel Grove has really been a great artificial reef for us. It brings down a lot of uh, excitement and adventure of new divers, uh, divers wanting to see something new down in the Florida Keys. Divers may love the wrecks, but critics question how they affect the environment, fish populations, and natural reefs. The Spiegel Grove is part of a long-term study on the impact of artificial reefs. Lad Atkins is a special projects manager of REEF, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. The Spiegel Grove is in a very unique position. Uh, it's in a sand bottom area, away from the reef, but somewhat close, uh, let's say within a quarter mile of nearby natural reef areas. And I think the intent was to put it far enough away that even if it moved a little bit, it wouldn't damage the natural reef but also close enough so that there could be interaction between the marine life on the natural reef system and on the wreck itself. And I think we're seeing a lot of that. Windy Wellington is living up to its nickname. With only three days to go before sink day on Saturday, the weather forecast is for gale force winds. We're three days in counting, and I hope these winds this morning are an indication that the uh, front is coming through now and not coming through on Saturday morning. But uh, we wouldn't be sailing today. There wouldn't be any hope of leaving harbor today. That's just as well. There's lots of work to do. The lubricating oils are long gone from the engine room, but there's still the accumulation of 37 years of grunge and grind to clean up. So bring on the supersized pressure washer and blast all the loose material down into the bilges where a vacuum pump truck can suck it up. Supersized pressure washers, supersized vacuum cleaners. All the last bits left in the cracks and crannies need to be removed. One hundred and fifty meters of rope, floats, and electrical wire. The firing line is hoisted on board. On sink day, it will connect the explosives on the ship with the team on the firing boat who push the button. The crew is working flat out, but that sink day deadline is fast approaching. At the moment, we're probably trying to fit a week's work into. Uh into two days, but we'll get there, but we'll work a bit longer tonight. Between you and me, we need another week to really get this thing ready to go 100%. I would feel a lot better than trying to sink on Saturday, but uh, you know, there's just so much to do, and you want this to be a really good reef. So I don't know, we'll, we'll make it work. Somehow we'll make it all work. Three days left until sink day. Roy Gabriel has been working flat out for a month, and a second set of experienced eyes would be welcome. Those eyes belong to Jay Strait, one of Roy's partners just arrived from Canada, and he has some concerns. See, this, this stuff just is just way too lightly built to take the kind of pounding it's going to get as the ship goes down. And what I'm afraid of is it's either going to come right out of its mouth, be hanging here in the diver space, or will be deteriorating relatively rapidly. I'm going to ask them to get a crew on here, punch these things out, which is actually not hard to do. Probably a good kickboxer could do it. And uh, at least give us a shot at getting the place properly ventilated. They've taken tons of material off the ship, and now it's riding higher in the water. That makes it too unstable to tow to the sink site. To lower it, they add weight, ballast, 
by flooding some of the compartments on the ship with water. But the flooding isn't going to plan. We're putting water in some tanks, and within a day, we're losing 10, 12 ton of water, so it's flowing someplace. Figuring out where the water is going and fixing it is crucial. The danger is this. When the ship starts to sink, and if one tank is empty, that will add a lot of lift to that side. If the empty tank was on the starboard side, and the ship develops a port list as it's sinking, the empty tank will emphasize that list and could cause the ship to roll over onto its side. It's a question of stability and safety. Tons of water in a compartment where it could move unexpectedly is a hazard. A hazard that has capsized other ships. What we have to do is take the plan, pull every tank top, mark it as full or mark it as empty, and then work from there. We have to try and solve this problem. We've got the data solved. It hasn't gone to the engine room. It hasn't gone to the boiler room. So it's obviously going into an empty tank someplace. Yeah. So we'll pull this lid here and have a look at it. It's a bit lower. They found where the water was going and have a plan to keep the trim, or the way the ship is balanced, the way they want it. Problems we were having in an hour ago, I think we've found some solutions to them, and right now we're just pumping some tanks back here. We're gonna drop the stern to the ship a little bit. One problem solved. Put the tank covers back and close off the vents with a wooden bung. Once again, Windy Wellington is living up to its nickname. With just two days left before sink day, the weather's not cooperating. We have a gentle zephyr in Wellington today. It's blowing its rig out, basically. <laughs> but will the ship be clean enough to sink? There are hundreds of meters of pipes carrying hydraulic oil. Pipes they thought were drained, but some weren't. And with the trim of the ship altered, some residual oil begins to leak out. Bad news. With the critical environmental inspection coming up, no oil means a clean ship. As long as we get these drained down, we're gonna be okay. The race to get the ship ready for the sink day on Saturday is heating up. Only two days left, and the environmental and safety inspection is underway. There's a lot at stake. If the inspectors don't give their okay, the ship doesn't sink on schedule. Inspector Patrick Atwood. We are looking for anything that's loose, that could break away when the ship goes down, anything that could be of a hazard to divers, and of course, any contaminants, the major one being any oil residues that are left on the ships. Not all the cleanup work is done, and the inspectors will have to come back tomorrow to check. But to keep on schedule, Roy Gabriel needs to install the explosives. We have a good news, bad news. What do you think? Is it looking fairly good? It's, it's looking reasonably good. Do I have the okay to start installing explosives tomorrow morning? Yeah. Thank you very much. Excellent. Hang on a sec. Thank you very much. It's taken weeks to plan and assemble the explosives that will put this ship on the bottom. Now it's time to install them. It will take 14 one-meter square holes blown through the side of the ship to sink her. And each one of these 14 explosive charges has been built to fit exactly against the curved hull. They're carried down to the bottom of the ship and fitted into place. One in the other side here. Okay, that'll stay there, Bruce. For the flex linear explosive to work effectively, it needs to be an exact distance away from the steel. When the engine room boiler room go off, to start with, these charges would jump right off the ship because there's so much shock wave and twisting going through the ship as it fires. All of this timber basically just gets, you know, blown into chipwood. Here, Jake. 
on the other side of the other one. Yeah. The charge is secured in place and the detonating cord to the primers is made ready to connect to the system. We're just standing above charges five and six here. We've already put explosives, so we close the area off. Nobody's allowed in. Unfortunately, we got less than 30 hours to go, so we have to, uh, we have to keep going here. The 14 explosive charges are placed against the hull just below the waterline at key points on the ship. The charges are fired in pairs, port side, starboard side. They don't go off all at once, but in a carefully planned sequence over several seconds. Typically, the engine and boiler room charges go off first, followed by the others. This firing sequence controls which part of the ship floods first and controls how the ship will sink. Not much time left. The last of the scrap is being moved off the dock. There's another explosives team on board the F-69. There will be a big pyrotechnics display as part of the sinking, and the pyro crew is busy assembling and installing all the mortars and shells and things that go bang that will add a dramatic touch to the event. The high explosives that actually sink the ship don't put on much of a show. They're below the waterline. So it's these fireworks the spectators will be seeing. Okay. Well, we ready to go? Yeah. With the charges in place, the next critical job is connecting the detonating core to the explosives on the hull of the ship. Boat there? Okay, hold on one second. Hang on to it. Detonating cord is a thin, flexible tube with an explosive core. John? If you got anything Exploding at almost 7,000 kilometers per second, it acts as a high-speed fuse and connects the electrically triggered detonator with the high-explosive cutting charges that are now installed. It's the last crucial link between pushing the button and the charges going off. And then straight in. Installing the detonators is the next step. First, string the electric wire that will be connected to the firing boat check the connection, and then clip on the detonators. This style of detonator is programmable, so you can change the timing of when a particular explosive charge will be set off. Six years of planning, fundraising, and over 90,000 entries in a contest to see who will push the button to sink the ship. It's all supposed to end with a bang on Saturday. But this is windy Wellington, and the wind's blowing about 40 knots. It's Saturday, the 12th of November. Uh, we've had to build in a 24-hour hole due to the uh, wind conditions. Uh, it's just not acceptable for trying to safely deploy the ship. Basically, our winds are hitting 30 to 40 knots. Um, we've got a requirement under insurance not to move in over 20 knots. We've got holes pretty close to the water, as you know. The sort of angst of hanging on another day, you're going, Ooh. but anyway, you know, we'll get there. It's, um, I'm not, I knew it was going to be, become stressful at some stage, and uh, I guess we're there. Here, yeah, just for posterity's sake, it's looking good. 6 a.m., November 13th, 24 hours behind schedule. The wind has dropped just enough, and it's a go. We've got a beautiful day, a little bit of breeze. We're going to be a crowded coast, that's for sure. I think every boat in the marinas over here will be gone, and all the marinas over there will be empty, and it's going to be a very big day. I'm looking forward to the moment. Her last departure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Significant yeah. moment. Leaves yeah. it out, leaves it out, Clark. Okay. Yeah, we're on our way. See you on the water, Jeff. Yeah. Six years. It all ends today. <laughs> A final salute from the cannons on the shore. a little dubious uh, first thing this morning. If we can keep this ship into the wind, that's fine for our purposes. We're at the upper end of our safety envelope uh, with this wind, but uh, we can proceed. Intentionally sinking a warship isn't an everyday event, and there's been a buildup of anticipation for this one. It's still early, and already spectators are gathering for the display. It will take almost two hours to reach the sinking site. There's time for breakfast. Oh, somehow, guys, I came here to sink this ship and hunt a cheap cooking bottle washer. Oh, come on, really? Something happened here. If I have to wash dishes, that's gone too far. <laughs> Just thought of it, I don't have to wash dishes. This thing's gonna sink. This boat's going down. <laughs> the sinking site for the F-69 is in Island Bay, just around the headland from Wellington Harbor. We're just coming around to uh, drop the anchor on the marker and um, we'll sort of anchor it in for the next couple of hours while we prep the ship. It sounds simple. Put the ship in position, bow into the wind, and drop the seven ton anchor while the tugs hold the ship in place. But once again, this anchor isn't cooperating. We've just been really cautious. We've got a lot of weight. They've got a seven ton anchor pulling on probably another seven or eight ton of chain, and uh, it's, you know, it's very capable of biting fingers off really quickly. There were problems getting the anchor onto the ship, and now there are problems getting it off the ship. The 24-hour weather delay, and now this delay, is causing problems. The big tugs holding the ship in position have to leave. They have other jobs to go to. How the ship is sitting in the water, how it's trimmed, determines the order of the explosions that will sink the ship. We changed the firing sequence from yesterday to today. We've already changed it once. Uh, I think I'm happy with that, but until I go about 100 meters off the side of the ship, I won't know for sure. I, I could very well change it again. The problem is solved. The anchor lets go. We had a snag with the uh, shackle initially. Had to get that out. Um, it's taken us an extra two hours. But hell, we're better than losing fingers and toes. So um, I'm pleased, very pleased. My butterflies have now gone. <laughs> At last, the ship is anchored, bowing to the wind, and the tugs cast off. The ship will still have to be pulled around to her final position for sinking but without the big tugs. We're gonna start at the bow and we'll start working our way all the way towards the stern, uh, checking and double checking everything, put the detonators on the system. There'll be 28 detonators to install all the way to the stern. The ship becomes increasingly hazardous. There are holes everywhere. And to complicate things, the waves are getting bigger, making the ship roll. The pyrotechnics crew comes aboard for their last minute preparations. Checking and double checking. If the ship is to sink on position and upright, everything has to go according to plan. This will be the last time we come down to look at the charges. We're going to just double check to make sure Somehow over the last day, none of the detonating cord has been uh, chafed or uh, 
nicked, and if we have, then we'll just put an extra piece on it. The F-69 is at anchor, and the spectators are gathering. But the ship has a slight list to port that needs to be fixed. Otherwise, the ship could roll onto its side as it sinks. We're in the uh, final phases of trying to take that port list out, which is uh, causing Roy and I a lot of worry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're on anchor and ready to go. Ready to go? Well, not quite. There's still that worrisome list to port. Water is being pumped into one of the tanks to compensate, to rebalance the ship. The job of connecting the detonators to the 14 explosive charges is almost complete. They're still pumping down there, aren't they? Yeah. OK. Uh, OK, I'm going to go and have a quick look, see how they are doing. It's a very technical job. <laughs> Stand and hang on to a hose. They're adding tons of water to this tank to remove the list. Three hours. If I can get the port list out of it, if I can do that, we're 100% ready to go. This class of ship is very fragile on bow area. So what we're going to do is try to go for as flat a sink as we can. And if anything, it's going to be a stern sink slightly. How the ship will sink depends on the timing of the explosive charges. And these timings can be programmed into the system and changed right up to the last minute. Check and recheck. Yeah, it is. John Jennings. The machine is telling us that everything's fine and we're virtually ready to go. All we need to do is run out the firing cable, connect up, and uh, press the button. With the wind coming out, it will be better to sink the ship's stern first. Roy wants to change the firing sequence of the charges yet again. And you just had the boys have a look out there, and it's down ever so slightly on the bum now, in the stern. So if we reverse those and put 7,000 here, and then the next one, and then give us the longer one there. I know it's not much of a change. Let's have a look at this again. Let's have a look at this. In this swell, I do not want the port side to start scooping water before the starboard side. Yeah. You know, in a perfect world, it's going to both sides are going to start scooping at the same time, and then it's, it's over when that happens. I think this is the last change. Crowds are gathering for the 3 p.m. sinking. The F-69 was anchored bow into the wind, and now she has to be pulled around to her final position. But with the big tugs no longer available, they have to rely on smaller boats. That boat's never going to handle it. Well, his engines have to go fast. These small boats are pulling on a 3,000-ton warship against a wind that's now pushing 30 knots and increasing. Even with no wind, this job would have been a challenge for the small boats. The ship is moving slowly, but the wind keeps increasing. If you look at a tension meter on this, when we detonate, we're at eight and nine. Uh, right now, we're uh, five and six and climbing. If we get 50 meters out of this, we'll be lucky in this wind. Yeah. This, right. is, this is not good. This was not supposed to happen. Against the odds, the small boats have pulled the ship around, and now they have to hold her against that increasing wind. But they're very close to the ship and those 14 high explosive charges. They can't quite hold it with that kind of light power and be this close, that's no. the problem. No, I, I would have liked them certainly a little further away than that. Maybe they can lengthen the lines out once, once they get us towed over to the spot. Are these guys going to be able to lengthen their tow ropes out at all? They're yeah, kind of about, close right now. Yeah, 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 but they'll all have to come in. Basically, in the final analysis, we only need two left, one on either corner. To hold it, yeah, once it's in position. It I'd like them a little further out if at all possible. Yeah. They're, if they are a little close to the ship. The small boats are having a hard time just holding the ship in position. The wind has now changed. Our firing cable is just going to be in a great big bowl. We'll be lucky we get 50 meters astern. Oh, well, it is what it is. We'll do it. It's time to get everything and everyone off the ship. 
With the increasing wind, the waves are getting bigger, getting closer to the opening on the side of the ship. If the sinking is to be controlled, they need to put her on the bottom soon. Goodbye, old girl. I'll see you on the bottom. All right, we're going to be late on this one. It's critical that no one is left on board. OK. How are you doing, Roy? Cameras. Oh, why do I do this? Because it's fun. Marco, all the best. I hope I hope it's an absolutely flawless, perfect sink. But yeah. this this wind is is bad. Yeah, that's all right. We're in alignment. Let's go. Let's okay, go. let's guys. Let's let's beat feet out of here. Hello. Let's get out of here. Okay. Just swing by the firing boat. I just want to tell Bruce to shoot it. I hope it's a perfect one, Marco. I really do. You've got a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. I got about a meter of freeboard. With the waves getting closer to all those openings on the hull, Roy wants to tell the firing crew to push the button now. You're on! Pick up your phone! I'm phoning you! Oh, an answering machine! Countdown's here, but they've got to put the one-minute flare up. Yeah. I'm glad. Is that the one minute? Okay. Congratulations. Over 90,000 people entered the contest to see who would push the button. Joe Smith was the winner. question is, did they fix that port list? You can let the firing line go. Yeah, they can let it go. They can let go of the firing line. The tension is building. Let the firing line go! Let the line go! She's going to port. Come on, come back, come back, come back, come back. With the ship listing to port, the next few seconds will be crucial. Pull in water, it'll come back. It's coming back. It'll come back. Yep, here she comes. Here it comes. Beautiful. Something beautiful. Beautiful. Come back, come back, come back. At the last second, the F-69 levels off. I'm not sure what the sink time was, but she uh, put a bit of a scare into us. She took uh, a fairly good port list. The extra work we did today, taking that list out, paid off. She had an extra bit of res what we call reserve buoyancy back in the stern, so she hung on longer back there than she otherwise would have, and that was long enough to get those secondary holes fully engaged, and down she went. As I wanted, I, I got the uh, vert or the uh, stern sink just slightly stern sink. The bow was the last thing down like it was yep. supposed to be. And that's, you can't ask for much more. No, 
I think it was letter perfect sink, and I, I think we'll find her very, very, you know, straight within one or, one or two degrees. If it's anything, it might be a little bit to port, maybe one, two, three degrees to port, which is more than acceptable. Okay, well, let's go home and get ready to take on another Navy. Oh. <laughs> I need a beer, though, pretty quick. Yeah, right. <laughs> Way to go, Roy. The F-69, the Wellington, now on the bottom. She could have been just scrap, turned into razor blades, tin cans. But a ship is so much more than tons of steel. A ship, like the Wellington, has history embedded in her skin. So now she can live on, giving back to the seas she once sailed.